Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lydia Khalil. I'm the AVERT coordinator, and we're here today with Anne-Marie van de Wiert uh, for our third in a series of post-symposium workshops. We're really excited to have Anne-Marie with us here to present on her research, not only to present on her research, but to off offer us something a bit different um, than we've done in the past. Not only will you be benefiting from um, Emory's presentation, but she'll run a simulation exercise for us um, participants toward the end of that. Um, I want to first start by um, uh, expressing um, apologies from our convener, Professor Michelle Grossman. Um, she had sincerely hoped to be in attendance tonight as she usually is. However, she's come down with a pretty bad cold and unfortunately can't join us. So unfortunately you're stuck with me for the introduction um, and some moderation for that. Um, so thank you again for uh, everyone for joining us and we can, uh, we can get started. I'll also first start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we all meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So for today's presentation, like I mentioned, we have um, Anne-Marie van de Wiert, a researcher at the uh, Research Center for Social Innovation at the University of Applied Science in Utrecht. Um, Anne-Marie, like I said, will first begin this webinar by delivering a presentation on how subjectivity and preconceptions held by primary care professionals and frontline workers can influence risk assessments. And she'll also discuss the experience of practitioners in the early detection of violent extremism among youth. Then she'll conduct a simulation exercise with the participants. Um, you all may have seen the note that I provided earlier where we'll be broken down um, during the simulation exercise into breakout rooms um, in order to uh, discuss the case study given and the questions given for us to um, consider. And then if there's time, the group's deliberations in, uh, will be incorporated into a question and answer session. So to introduce um, uh, Anne-Marie, I'm very pleased uh, to do so. Um, like I mentioned, she is a researcher at the University of Applied Science at Utrecht. Um, and she is also a lecturer in counterterrorism, international relations, organized crime at the Institute for Safety and Security Management Studies. Uh, and so over to you. And Marie, thank you again for being with us yes. and for making time in your morning. <clears throat> thank you. Yes, it's uh, it's eight o'clock in the morning here. Um, so that's always really strange, but you have that all the time, I guess, uh, on the other side of the <laughs> world. Um, so yes, I, uh, I'm very um, thankful that I can do this. Um, uh, do you want me to introduce myself a little bit more or just go start with the presentation? Please, if there's anything you'd like to add, feel free to go ahead. Well, I think it's one thing I'd like to uh, mention specifically again is that um, I know you probably all have a background in uh, detection at some kind of level or stage in, call it radicalization towards uh, violent extremism processes. But the research that we've done is really specifically focused on the first line professional. So that means uh, the, the, the ground level, as we call it, like the people who work in the communities. Uh, and I specifically want to mention that because that's a really, really uh, important distinction for the understanding of, of what we're talking about. So I'll tell you uh, a short, briefly, how we came to this uh, focus point. Um, the professor I work for, uh, Dr. Corinne Eichmann, maybe some of you already have known, met her over the past years. She has done a lot of terrorism research for the University of Leiden. And when I spoke to her, I think it was like uh, 2015, um, I said to her, like, I, I find it so peculiar that when you have a policy and you say like, hey, we need to have the people on the ground level, like the people who are actually working in communities, we need to give them a detection assignment because that seems like the most logic and ideal situation. I mean, they have contact with uh, society, uh, they know what's going on in neighborhoods, and they might even in some cases have a look behind the front door in houses. So why not enroll them in, um, in the whole detection like setup, like in the network. So let's give them, let's give them a mandate, uh, go on the lookout for radicalization. That was in the Netherlands, basically in the line. 
Um, you have contact with civilians. If you detect anything, uh, what you might think is uh, to do with radicalization, report it. Uh, report it to, I don't know, the, 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 the municipality or the local police, but do something with it. Uh, so this was this is a very vague, a very vague mandate. And then I said to Quirin, um, it, can, can we can we just do that? Can we just assign these people who have like tons of other responsibilities and tons of other focus points? Can we really like uh, assign them this well, kind of important job? Because you know this, this is not something. I mean, this, this is about in the end, it's about terrorism. So. Maybe we maybe we should we, we should look into that, like because then the question is how do they do that? What do they detect? What do they look for? What what is their perspective? And she says, yeah, that sounds really good because I, I can't recall of any research that's already been done on this in this phase and in this part. So yeah, go ahead. So I was really lucky, and she gave me money to do that. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, can I, yeah, can you go to the next slide? because I can't control it now myself, can I? Yeah. Okay, so um, I work for the Lecturer Access to Justice. Um, so it has like a kind of a social legal background. Uh, so what we decided to do, if you wanna look at the perspectives of these first line professionals, we wanna kind of look at the judgment they make in early risk assessments. But then of course, from, you know, within, 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 uh, leaving from the democ uh, democratic values and norms, like we have a, a, you know, we have a liberal state, we come from a democracy, we can't just go monitoring everybody, like we, we have to have these standards high. Can I have the next slide, please? So it's important to realize that we leave from the principle of justice and the principle of equality. Um, well, I assume that you all <laughs> are really uh, well aware of these principles. Um, mind you, uh, this is just a little sidestep. Uh, I also have to teach, of course, sometimes at the university to students. And I always, whenever, it doesn't matter what the course is, I always go through these principles with them because especially youth, they hardly, they are, they are so not aware what the democratic values are these days. They, 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 they take it for granted almost. And I think that's really, that is a really a lack, a lack in education or bringing up. Um, we, there should be really much more awareness, like what exactly are the core values of a democracy, but this is a sidestep. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, so we looked at, of course, we call it early detection. So that is uh, detection of signals of radicalization in a very, very early stage. So these are, faces uh, in people's behavior that are not actually, you cannot pinpoint them to, um, to unlegal behavior or criminal behavior. This is, these are actually law abiding citizens. So what you, early detection is about mindset, worldviews um, and uh, thoughts, like what they're thinking, what, what they think. So it's really abstract because you know th this happens in, in people's head and they can they can of course speak it out and they can express it um, they can express it in different ways but it's not that they've done acts that we can pinpoint to like hey that that is you know that that that's not allowed you cannot do that you're you know, you're trespassing now or whatever so it's 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 about the it's about thoughts. And if you give that assignment to the first line professionals, then there are, there are some factors of this that make the situation really complex. Um, for example, uh, we, we all have like all these dynamics going on in society, things happening with the, the push and the pull factors, the trigger factors, whatever, um, on, on uh, micro, meso, maso, me, uh, how do you call it, <laughs> macro level. So it's, you know, a lot of things are constantly going on in society that, that, makes, that make people react. Um, professionals have to give real time responses to these changes. And like I already dis, uh, explained to you, the, the, the assignment to go on the um, uh, detection of radicalization in the Netherlands, at least, was a very poorly defined task. Uh, then they sometimes, uh, professionals can feel time pressure because, you know, it has a responsibility because it's about safety. 
safety always puts a little like pressure, time pressure, like we have to make quick decisions. And it also has significant personal impact if they, of course, get it wrong or make errors. So they think like, well, I, I can't get this, you know, I have to do this right. So um, yes. And then the last thing is in the ideal situations, they, they you know, you, they don't make, of course, these decisions on, on their own. You, you ideally go and uh, reflect on it with colleagues or within a network. And there you have uh, experienced and unexperienced decision makers. And um, yeah, that, that can cause for all kinds of biases like uh, groupthink or authority bias. So they could be impressed or they could be overestimating themselves. So then this, these are all human, this is a human factor coming in. So this is just to lay out like the, some factors that influence this decision-making process. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, so then our question was like, uh, okay, so <clears throat> in, in you have the performative, then the performative power is at play. Performative power is a theory by uh, Beatrice de Graaf and uh, Bob de Graaf, uh, very Dutch surnames when I pronounce it now. Um, it says that uh, the effectiveness of policy is not within how the policy has been set up or the documents that describe it. It's about how the people who have to unroll it, perceive it and what they do with it. What, how do they interpret their own role to play in it? That, that is called the performative power of policy. We'll come back to that um, in the, when, when we run through the simulation. So then I thought, okay, so you give these people a role in the prevention of radicalization. Uh, there are some documents and policies with vaguely tasks, but it's a mandate, so it's quite strong, it's quite severe. So they feel like, okay, I have to do something with this. Then how, how do they do this? So what are their capabilities to actually identify these risks? So they're not, they're not purely trained to do this. They have other tasks. I mean, we're talking again, youth workers, uh, community police officers, civil servants from municipalities. These are not the counter uh, terrorism or the intelligence people who are trained to do these kind of risk assessments. So what then are the effects uh, of, this, of this practice in real life? Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so again, uh, I want to look at I wanted to look at the perspective uh, from a human perspective. What do they, you know, what do they bring in? Uh, and I'll yeah uh, explain that later. So again, youth workers. We were more focusing on like how do they do that? That yeah, signaling or detection. Municipality officers. How do they weigh uh, incoming um, uh, uh, cases? How do they indicate them? And community police officers, we looked a little bit more, but these are minor, these are minor, you know, um, focus, special focus points in the, in the research. How do they actually acquire information when they do their rounds through the neighborhood? Like in, in the Netherlands, that community police officers should be like 80% of their time, just basically be there, just be present. And how, how do they proactively, how do they proactively go and look for information without any leads at that point. Uh, you see here that the uh, to total uh, amount of people we've interviewed is 55. Um, that was already a lot. <laughs> we, we expected to not get that many people willing or cooperating, especially not from the police or from the municipality. Youth workers are a little bit more, I don't know, like they do like, I, I go do my own way and I find this important, so I participate. Uh, but also, especially also the, the municipality officers and the community police officers, they were really willing to talk to us because they, you know, they, they they were like, yeah, I know I have this task. I have no idea what to do with it. So let's, I really want to talk about it because that's also, they wanted to reflect on it. Um, we could have gone, done like tons more, but you know, it's, it's saturation at one point. So 55 was, was good. Okay, next slide, please. Um, these were the main like basic research questions. I also wanted to know the difference between the concept. Do they know actually the difference between the concepts of radicalization and violent extremism? 
And do they know that radicalization, when you talk about it, is actually you're talking about a process, a behavioral process. I wanted to know that because of the uh, uh, principle, uh, because of the, the two democratic principle, principles and values, like, and, and, and also, is it clear to them? Is it, is it actually clear? Are the concepts clear to them? And of course, very important questions like how do then they then uh, assess whether someone poses a potential risk? Again, we're talking mindset here, not not actions or you know, uh, illegal uh, illegal acts. So how what what how do they substantiate that? And are we looking at different forms of extremism? Well, that's got to do, of course, very clearly with the principle of equ equality. Um, uh, next slide, please. But let's talk a little bit more now about how do they how did they uh, how do they do that how do they do that in real life how do they assess that so this is this is what we're continuing on now yes next slide please okay uh, to actually um, be able to measure that I had to of course use some kind of um, model so I. Um, I looked into Jonathan Haidt um, uh, from the uh, New York University. He has also that uh, great book about the righteous mind and how people, you know, make judgment. And it's, it's, it's a theory about moral judgment. And um, it's based that, that, that uh, people in our brain, you know, and how we are, we are structured and built as human beings, that we, we have the tendency to really fast go to the, the good or bad labeling or the right or wrong or the black or white. Um, I think we all recognize this. This is a, this is a human, <laughs> human bias. Um, next slide, please. So leaving from that, how do I analyze that then? Um, I wanted to look at three indicators. Um, the knowledge, like they had in the Netherlands, the situation that, okay, I already said they were not properly, properly trained as uh, uh, intelligence uh, service agents, but they, um, the municipalities were given money from the government to buy trainings. Um, but the, the thing with that was that these were all commercialized companies um, and there was no overview of what they were actually, uh, what, what, their, what their training contains like what, what what was what was their content what were they telling there was no no overview no that was like an open open free market so basically everybody everybody could do it basically everybody could say like hey i'm, I'm gonna give this training if you just give me thousand euros i'm gonna give you this training so i wanted to know a little bit like how uh how is their how is their knowledge built up because you know what what, what, do, what do they use to substantiate that and then I wanted to look at the normative, uh, their normative judgments. So yeah, that you could call that a framework. It's, it's like the norms and values that they bring in, you know, how do they substantiate that? What, what is important? What do they think is important to, to make these judgments? And I also, if you look at uh, moral judgment, you also have to look a little bit at the subjective part, the intuition, like what are, the, what are their personal feelings um, also called emotions, like what, how do they actually uh, personally emotional feel about people who are straying off on you know radicalization path towards violent extremism? What 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 is how do they how do they feel about that themselves? Next slide, please. Yeah. Again, I'm gonna make a focus here. Uh, I thought that it would be really, really important in my research to specifically focus on the norms and values. Uh, that was because I, I thought I had to leave from the democratic norms and values and that that was really important and that I had the, I don't know, I had the assumption that, that this would that this would be a, like that everybody had that for, as a natural thing. So I was really focused on that one. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and then this was the outcome of the uh, interviews, <laughs> making a big step here. Um, the outcome was that in the end, I had these open interviews with them talking about, you know, knowledge, their normative judgments, I, I, you know, their intuitions, their emotions. I mean, basically every single one of them, they said in the end, you know what? I just go by gut feeling. Uh, that's, that's it. 
I just use my gut feeling. Uh, if, if I, I sense if something's wrong or not, and that's it. And then I was like, oh God, because that's, that, is, that is subjective. That is the third one. That is the intuition that you're, they're using, that, that is emotionally driven. And um, I went a little bit further with that. I was like, but doesn't, doesn't that then have a high potential for estimation errors? This is a question. I haven't researched this. I haven't had the opportunity to go through it or what, what the outcome of this was, but it, it would be really, I was a bit like, uh, we, we, maybe, we maybe need to do something with this. Like if people judge in the end, in these situations by gut feeling, then could that, could that be harmful? Could that give a high potential for estimation errors? Well, you know, logically or in theory, yes. Uh, next slide, please. So, but if, you know, beside that that, that, that could be the case, uh, what, what this conclusion tell, told me is that in the end, uh, it, it counts like, it, it all depends, the effectiveness of the policy, like the performative power, effect in, in the end is based on the best person doing the job instead of best practice. Um, and that, that's just a random, that's, that could be a lucky shot, you know, like we, we have no idea. Uh, this, it's so unstructured. Everybody, everybody has like so much, much uh, space uh, in this phase to do this early detection. So yeah, we, we basically depends on luck and how, how good people are uh, at it or how, how driven they are by their human biases or how, how objectively they can, you know, structure their thoughts. Um, next slide, please. Um, but of course, I was asked then, okay, but uh, can you give us some, some advice? Because, okay, we know now that it's mostly uh, driven by gut feeling, uh, okay, that has a potential for estimation error. Uh, so basically, the, uh, the, 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 the whole policy depends, the effectiveness of the policy depends on best people instead of best practice. But can you give me some kind of norm? You know, the, uh, of course, it's always really comforting if you have like, I don't know, like a benchmark. So I said like, well, you know, when you look at radicalization, then at least be aware. And if, you, if you're looking into people's thoughts and in their mindset and in their, what they're thinking, their worldviews, at least be aware that uh, also that is a, um, a, a freedom, a liberty. People can think whatever they want. You know, it's, 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 it's the freedom of speech, but that is not absolute. There is, there is a, uh, a line and that is the line when they cross the willingness or the incitement or even the attention to commit violence because violence is not exceptional. And that, that is, you know, that's crossing the line. Um, so that is where free speech stops. That is free. The, the you know that it, that's where the free mind stops. We cannot harm other people. So when you when you are a community police officer, or you are a uh, youth worker or a civil servant, bear that in mind. Radicalization in itself is uh, it doesn't really say much. It could, it could also be a good thing in in some cases. Um, it could also bring good stuff. But when people cross the line in with with their worldviews and their speech in and that they that with the intention, the willingness or the incitement to commit violence, or at least they harm other people while doing it. Yes, then we might have a kind of a, a, a quasi legal norm. And that gives us the, uh, the permission to intervene in an early stage. Maybe we can step in then and see if we can if we can stop that process, maybe we can see if we can uh, see if we can can, can put a hold on it. Uh, so this is about legitimization of uh, of interventions. Um, okay, next slide, please. Yeah. So what we've did, I've just I just briefly no, that that one. Uh, I just briefly now gave you a summary of the research we've done. It was a project of about three years, uh, like uh, different um, professions, and we wrapped it up in an in an animation. Uh, I, I want to show it to you. This is this is actually a wrap up from what I've just told you. So uh, Benjamin, can you run the animation? Thank you.
Uh, I don't hear the sound. Is that you don't hear the voiceover? In order to combat criminality, a policy is pursued in the Netherlands whereby abnormal behavior is detected at the earliest and I, I possible don't see stage. The now. I hear this myself, but I don't see the detection. In theory, referred to as anticipatory <clears throat> justice, we, we, because the focus is on a. We see the animation, Emery. Okay. Early detection is aimed at people who are considered to be at risk due to certain factors and circumstances. Think of poverty or lack of future prospects, or a history with aggressive behavior and or destruction. Early detection is also aimed at people who would radicalize and start to oppose society. The early warning system takes shape at a local level. Community police officers form a safety network with professionals from the care and welfare domain. Together they must gain timely insight into potential threats on the intersection of public order and healthcare. The idea is do not pick up when something has happened, but insist preventively on behavioral change. The bottom line is that social workers are asked to turn off their feelers and share information with the police and other security services. However, working together at the intersection of care, welfare, public order and safety creates an area of tension. There is a risk that the focus on the preventive monitoring of civilians within a security framework could indicate any deviation in behavior, expression and appearance as a potential problem. This can produce estimation errors. We can therefore say that the effect of preventive policy ultimately depends on the perception of professionals, how they see things. That presents a dilemma because early detection is mainly based on undesirable nuisance and or deviant behavior. Actually, no illegal activities have taken place yet. The reality is that these behaviors are not necessarily punishable by law. This raises the following questions. What is the standard against which you must test deviant behavior? And what do you base a social intervention on? Because the early detection of undesirable nuisance and deviant behavior is not clearly defined, the criteria for gathering information and monitoring are lacking. Research by the Lecturate Access to Justice has shown that gut feelings in particular influence the way in which local professionals assess these problems. That is because no one can say with certainty when someone is going to pose a threat to society. From a justice perspective, subjective judgment can be problematic. This is because a sense of unfair treatment or the experience of injustice is an important motivation for people to turn against society. This way, violence and crime could be fueled. In this respect, early detection can even be counterproductive. We judge each other from our own point of view, also called moral judgment. Self-reflection and awareness of involved professionals are necessary in this case. Consider, what is abnormal behavior? When is this unwanted and inconvenient? And what information do you actually need to assess whether someone poses a threat? <clears throat> yes, so... Um... Next slide, please. If you if you like, uh, we have this uh, we have this form. You could fill in if you don't want to do it. You don't have to do it. Especially, don't do it now. But uh, you can you can just scan this QR code uh, with your mobile phone, and then you get like a really short questionnaire, like five questions, to just you know see it as a kind of a reflection thing for yourself. Uh, to, uh, to answer these questions that were just uh, given in the animation. Um, but this is just an extra 
an extra thing. I do this with students or when I when I give trainings uh, in real life and then we go, go through it. We're not going to go through it today, but uh, see it as something for yourself if you, uh, if you like, think it's fun. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah. So this was the uh, this was the, the wrap up of my research. If you have any questions, um, here's my email address. Um, there's also like a, about five five publications, uh, open access. They're all open access. Um, they're in the in the main um, the main literature. So the, it's um, from Oxford University Press. Uh, the the in, in terrorism and political violence. Um, the, um, I don't know, they're, they're, they're in big, uh, easy, easy, accessible and easy findable uh, publications. Um, I would like to go uh, move forward to do the simulation with you. I'm not sure uh, if Lydia wants to have like a really small break to just let this all sink in or do you want to move forward to the simulation? Um, thanks, Henry. I think for the um, interest of time um, and to make sure that we have enough time for the simulation and discussion, we should move forward. But I do want to thank you for um, a really fascinating presentation and at least for me putting some um, frameworks and some empirical uh, evidence behind, I think, some an idea that often sits in the background for a lot of us around subjectivity. So I really appreciated that. Um, so with that in mind, and again, with the time constraints, if you could just move on to the simulation, that would be, that sure. would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so while, um, while Benjamin is showing that, yeah, um, um, we, we said like, okay, so this is about ref reflectivity, reflect on yourself. Um, uh, you're going to be divided into, uh, into groups later on, um, mostly five people. Uh, and reflect also with the other people, try to be as open in it. Um, and there's there's no, I want to specifically say, there's no right or wrong. I'm not going to say in the end, oh, you got it totally wrong. So don't, don't be afraid of that. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the cliffhanger is also that I also can't tell you what would be the right thing. So <laughs> this is an experience we have to go through all together. Um, so you don't expect like a, a, a good or right outcome of this. So feel free to do think and you know with your group and reflect in whatever way. And please, I encourage you actually to go go maybe a little bit further, go out of the box in that. Um, okay, yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit about the performity again, just to, to get you a little bit sharp. Um, performity matters. It's, it, it means, it says that in day-to-day -day practice, it is, it is necessary to have insight in how uh, frontline, again, I, I'm talking about frontline professionals, how they, uh, how they, how they, um, how they deal with the policy so it's not that much how it's how the policy is presented to them it's also but it's also how it's perceived by the professionals what do they do with the mandates they are giving because that ultimately depends the effectiveness or the effect in general of policy next slide please why is this important this is just a really small wrap up before we start it's important because uh, it can have side effects. This is about democratic norms and values. Again, we, we don't want to go into the uh, field of stigmatization, criminalization, certain groups. These are just a few things that could happen. Administrative arbitrariness. You can name many other things. Next slide, please. Again, judgment is based on three perspectives. This is from a book, a Dutch book of social work. It says again, we have you have the uh, if you look if we look in the world all, all day long in everyday practice, whatever we do, we look through three kinds of well glasses. You could say we have uh, what we've learned that's cognitive. We have our norms and values, it's normative. And we have our uh, own personal emotions and feelings or intuitions. That ultimately depends how we view things. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is the this is the the case simulation, the training. Um, I uh, I advise you to take notes. So please, if you have a pen and paper ready, um, there are two questions that I would like you to discuss with your group. I'm going to present you a case. It's not a really large case. You're going to give like bits of information. Uh, it's it's fragmented. Um, I want you to, to go run through with your group, what are the challenges of this case uh, in general? Like if you, if, if you have to deal with this case, uh, no matter, and let loose what your background is. So if you are a police officer, then maybe, you know, try to think uh, out of the box, try to think not within your profession, but you can, of course, with your group, I hope we get a nice mixture of different professions in each group, you can, of course, uh, uh, explain to each other where you come from and then, you know, it's substantiate how you, how you think you have to deal with this. What are the challenges of the case? And secondly, would you intervene? And if so, yes or no, how or why not? These are the main questions. And after the breakout rooms, we're going to come back and I'd like you, uh, each one member of each group to report back so we can discuss this. Uh, so I'm not sure if Benjamin is going to assign a group leader, or but you have to do that yourself then otherwise. Okay, next slide, please. These questions will come back after the case again. This is the case. We're in Amsterdam. It's May the 4th, 2022. Next slide, please. And please take notes. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about Lucas. He's 19 years old. He's born and raised in Amsterdam. He is the only child in his family. He has always performed very well in school. He started university. He recently joined a volunteer group by him saying so, not clear what about. For the past year, he has openly expressed views on immigration policy. He has done so on uh, social media, among friends, and at home at the kitchen table. Okay, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> Eric is the father of Lucas, and he is using his son's laptop, no matter, doesn't matter why. Um, he, he, he opens the laptop and he sees that Lucas has been active on storm funds. It's a nationalist um, forum in, um, I, I guess you've heard about it. He sees he's not, he's, he's not aware of what it is. So he's, he's curious and he starts reading. Next slide, please. He sees an open thread on storm funds where his son Lucas posted several like hateful comments related to immigrants. Uh, it is below a post about a rally, which is scheduled for June 4th in Brussels, where the headquarters of the European Union are. Next slide, please. It is not clear to Eric if Lucas has any concrete travel plans to go to Brussels. Eric feels really hope, hopeless and he doesn't know what to do about like his son participating in uh, a platform like Stormfront, which again is a nationalist platform. Next slide, please. Okay, the next day, May 5th, Eric runs into a very good friend of Lucas um, at a local store. And he asks, well, he takes the opportunity to ask this friend about his son. The friend says, well, I haven't actually seen Lucas for a while now. We haven't been hanging around lately. But he also says he has a little bit of concerns about Lucas because he has heard that he has been seen with someone he knows was in the possession of firearms. This is all, this is what they, there's been talk about that. Eric decides, okay, I need to confront my son 
about this about this situation. I need to confront him. Next slide, please. So Eric tells his son that he's concerned, like the parental talk. Uh, it starts, of course, with, well, you have a lack of interest in participating in family activities. We hardly see you around. You come in, you go again. I mean, I know you want to have your own life, but, you know, I'm worried. What, what, what are you doing? Uh, what are you doing in your free time? And I have the idea you spend a lot of time online. Um, and actually, I, I, well, I know I'm probably not allowed to, but anyways, uh, I, I opened your computer um, and I saw that you've been active on uh, Stormfront. Like, wh what is that forum? Um, there was some material. You, and I, I think you, you made some racist comments there. Like, what, what, this is not how we raised you. What, what are you doing? Well, why? I don't understand. Lucas, like as a teenager he is, he doesn't answer the questions and just leaves the house. Not clear where to. Okay, next slide, please. The next day, Lucas doesn't come home, by the way. Lucas doesn't come home. The next day, Eric is, of course, very, very worried. He doesn't know what to do. And he thinks like, okay, maybe I should talk to the to the local police. Um, I have not, but well, it says you report the situation uh, for the police, of course, when you, when you, you know, uh, contact them that they assume that you're reporting something. For Eric as a father, it's more like, okay, I, I need some, I need some advice or guidance. I have no idea where to go to. Let's talk to the police. In the, in the Netherlands, we have a so-called CTER box. It stands for uh, uh, Contra Terrorism. Um, and it's an info box. We, we work with info boxes where you, when police officers, they, if they have information, they can, they can label it, basically label it with specific topics. So this community police officers, he checks the CTR box to see if, there, if there's any information uh, already about Lucas in there. Uh, but th there was nothing in there. Um, he does, however, finds that Lucas was uh, arrested like a while ago for driving under the influence of alcohol. Eric didn't know that. Um, so he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that was a bit of a... Uh, unsuspected, un unexpected outcome. Next slide, please. Okay, this was the case. This is the information you get. Um, I realize it's fragmented and you probably have tons of questions, but this is how it works uh, in real life. You get bits of information at the local level. You're a frontline, you're a frontline um, professional. Uh, you have a concerned father. What are the challenges of this case in general? And would you intervene within a safety network? And if so, how? And then also think about like who would need to take the lead on that? Uh, which, which organizations or institutions should be participating in that? And if you don't think you want to or can intervene, also explain why not. 